So, hello everyone. My name is Piotr Bieriet. Thank you for coming here. And today I'm going to talk about the synergy between the Blender, which is actually a 3D software, very versatile tool, and also the real hardware, which is a robotics in my case, especially in context of 3D scanning. So, a few words about me. I'm, I've been using Blender for about 10 years right now, so quite long. I started from 2.4 something. I remember the pink outline in Blender. So, I also worked a little bit in the game dev and also e-commerce. So, I also prepared some assets for VFX. So, I work in many industries. And right now, I switch a little bit more to the programming side and to the technical art. And currently, I'm running my own company, Involved. And from the internet, you can know me as McGavish. All right, so as we, can, as we saw during the whole conference that Blender is very versatile tool. It, it was used in many incredible ways for many different purposes. But can we actually use it for robotics? Like, can we use it like a viewer to control something in the real world? The, the answer is, of course, yes, because it's Blender. It can be used wherever you want and however you want. So let's, let's dive into, before we dive into the details, let's, let me tell why I even started building that hard, hardware. So everything started around 2018, so when I joined the Forte Digital Company. I got interested in the 3D scanning, which is a very wide term, but especially I got into the photogrammetry, which is a small part of 3D scanning. And uh, par photogrammetry is actually very, also, also very vers versatile tool and technique. So it's very flexible, but it has, it has some drawbacks and also many advantages. So what is the photogrammetry? As you may know, the photogrammetry is just a technique where you took many photos of the given object from many angles and then using photogrammetry software like Reality Capture or Metashape, you can combine that into the 3D, mod 3D model and also you can capture very sharp textures, which is not very common in the industrial grade scanners, let's say like structure light or laser scanners, where textures are, are mostly very poor. So photogrammetry in this case has very nice textures. For, so for creative uh, industries, it's a very nice, very nice tool. As you can see, there's a lot of cameras to properly reconstruct the, even the simple objects, especially if you want to, go, if you want to have uh, sharp textures. So that's one of the problems. So you need many, many images. And it also takes the time to prepare them, to capture them, to not make any errors, to also keep the proper distance to the object. So in this case, it's much more labor intensive method compared to other scanners like Structure Light, for example. So those are the features of the photogrammetry. As I said, it's very flexible because you can scan very small figurines with proper hardware, for example but also you can scan, for example, huge buildings, like building sites or whatever you want. So it's very, very flexible. And that's a huge advantage. It's much cheaper because nowadays almost everyone have a phone and with cameras, so it's not a problem to take some pictures of some objects and just process them. Also, the textures, as I said, are very high resolution, so it's a, also a huge, huge advantage, especially for the creative industries where the textures matters. But there are some drawbacks, like, for example, it fails on featureless surfaces, especially that because it's a passive method compared to structure light, which is active method. So it's, it base, it's, it's based on the features, on the texture of the object. So it's, if there's no features, no textures, then probably there's no mesh eventually. So that's a problem. And as I said, it requires many images and it's very tedious and monotonous. So I, I really hate that method because of that. But what can we do about this? We can, of course, automate it with some hardware. So to make that stuff less boring, especially for small size, size objects, because I'm focused mostly on the small size. I'm not going to scan buildings, but more or less objects with, like, let's say, one meter by one meter by one meter. That's the biggest size, let's say. So of course, we can use, for example, turntable, automatic turntable with tripod and a camera on top of that which is, of course, very cheap, simple to use, in, and in most cases, it works fine. But it, as always, there are some drawbacks. So in case if the object is relatively symmetrical, there's no very uh, weird shapes. It's not very, there's no many occlusions of the objects. 
it, it probably will work fine. But in more complex scenarios, let's say like, like this, when the Suzanne is uh, lying on the, like rotated in 90 degrees. So for example, uh, can you see my, oh yeah, you can see that. So for example, this part here might be in focus, but the, the rest part like this eye might be out of focus. So when we rotate like 90 degree, the other side will be in focus and the other side will be out of focus. So that's a huge problem. And of course we can, you know, improve that by moving the tripod with the camera, but it's not actually very effective because it's manual work. So we want to avoid manual work at all. So the very simple approach would be to use automatic turntable using Arduino. I personally very ha hate uh, off-the-shelf products, so I want to design everything by myself, try different hardware and automation possibilities, and to write the software that I know exactly what it does. So this is the very simple approach where you have a relay module for the camera trigger. So you can, for example, trigger camera, which is uh, synchronized with the rotations of the turntable. We have a simple stepper motors, something like in, in 3D printers, and also the Arduino, for example, Uno, with the CNC shield. So it's very cheap and very simple approach in this case. But uh, here is another example. What's the problem with the focus? So for example, let's assume that this shoe is lying on the turntable and it's perfectly in focus. So here is the perfect focus. But when it rotates like 90 degree, this part here is still in focus, but this part here is out of focus. So that's the main problem of the turntable. So in perfect world, uh, the camera will follow the shape of the geometry, but often it's not possible and not trivial to, to do, and definitely much harder to do that with the simple tripod. So how, we, how can we automate that and how can we make the process a little bit better? We need to build a robotic arm, which is not, it, it might be overcomplicating the problem, maybe over engineering the problem, but why not? Let's, let's see how to approach this problem. So the general plan is quite simple. We, I personally decided that it might be very simple at the beginning. That's why I used Arduino. So it's very cheap. There's no, there's no problem to find some tutorials in the internet, how to properly program it. And also the whole hardware must be easily modifiable. So in this case, I went with the plywood, for example, for the mine construction with laser cutting. And uh, another uh, main criteria here is the possibility to automatically trigger the camera. So it's, very, it's the same approach like before, so I'm using the simple relay module. And also it must be strong enough because often the camera mounted on this robot is like 100 times more expensive than the robot itself. And also it must be lightweight, so it might, might be small enough and also easily controllable from the software because I cannot imagine that we can control complex machine with, for example, writing coordinates by hand in some software. So we need to have a visual representation of the robot in reality. So what can we do about that? Uh, as I used Blender many years, I instantly thought about using Blender for this case. And Blender has many great features like Python API, which is awesome. And as you know, it's it gives the Blender incredible power, power and makes it an incredible powerful tool. We have also inverse kinematics, so we can assume that uh, someone much smarter than us, for example, in math, implemented that correctly, and we can use the, directly those values in our software. And we can avoid many bugs made us, for example, me while I program the hardware. So also I can reduce the time needed for that. We have many helpful constraint modifiers like track tool, limit distance, and so on. We can create a simple UI. It's multi-platform, so we can use that on Linux, Windows, and it's easily distributed. There's an easy distribution, of course. Yeah, so in case of robotic arms, we'll of course use the Pi serial, which is quite helpful to communicate with, for example, with Arduino directly. For some computation, we can use Num NumPy and threading for some asynchronous uh, computations. And also the power of Blender that it follows Python updates. So we have almost always this, the most modern Python included in the Blender. And as I said, there's are, there are massive integration automation possibilities. So this is the 
converted CAD model into the Blender. So we can see how the inverse kinematics works in this case. I put some bones into the model just to read it properly. And then I can just, using Python, track how those uh, bones are rotating regarding its parents and just transfer those data into, directly into the motherboard of the, of the hardware. We have many useful constraints, as I said. So for example, the track tool. So for example, it, it tracks constantly our target position, whether it's a focus point or the something, something else, we can easily track that. And also, for example, using the limit location, limit distance, also like angular limits for the bones. We can make some safety integrations to make sure that ro our robot won't break the, the environment around it. And this is how it looks in Blender, the whole setup. So it's quite simple. The model is directly converted into the, the mesh from the cut. So it's very straightforward. I just added the bones, rigged it, added the turntable, Everything is controlled using the single empty, so it's very helpful to use and uh, implement the inverse kinematics in this case. And this is how it looks in reality. So here you can see the preview from the Blender and uh, how it works. So there's a very small lag between the input and the actual movements. The movements are coordinated. So for example, if one axis, like one joint of rotation, has a longer angular distance than the other one, it just simply moves faster than the, the other one. So all stepper motors are stopping at the same time. And there are some also end stop to properly calibrate it because I wanted to avoid any encoders to track those rotations because I wanted to make it simple, simple as much as possible. And it's made uh, out of plywood, so it was very cheap and very easily modifiable because you can just cut it, glue it, or whatever you want. And the architecture in this case was quite simple. So I implemented everything directly in Blender. So Blender was the main controlling software here. Everything happened in Blender. It was directly communicating with the motherboard, in this case Arduino, so there was a bidirectional communication. And the Arduino directly used like stepper motors, so it was just used a unidirectional communication because there was no feedback from the robot itself because there was no encoders or any more advanced stuff. So let's focus on this specific part. Here is an example what the commun communication looks like, for example, for the move command. So user, for example, move the robot in Blender. Uh, the thread, for example, in Blender tracks the movements. If it's different than the previous movement, the previous position, the Blender sends the comment to, comment to motherboard. After the movement is done, the motherboard sends back some responses. And then the Blender gets unlocked, sent back some information to the user, and so on and so on. So it's very simple. We can use, for, for example, the modal operator here to, instead of threading, for example, to, to track some uh, asynchronous operations. Let's get back to the scans because it's all about scans here and Blender. So uh, I wanted to scan something more interesting than another rock on uh, another brick. So I asked the Polish sculptor Tomasz Odziewicz if I can scan some of his sculptures. All of them are handmade, so there's no like digital copy of that. So uh, that also opens some opportunities to try to 3D print like smaller or bigger versions. And I also wanted to try to push the uh, photogrammetry to its limits. For example, I had to use the uh, focus stacking in this case. Those sculptures were quite small, like 20 centimeters high. So I had to improvise some, some method like focus stacking here. Here is another example, and here is the 3D printed version. So basically, in this case, it's all perfectly good enough. Almost all details were reconstructed, and still for a very small price compared to professional structure light scanners, because if you want to scan something like with this high detail, the structure light scanner or laser scanner will cost like maybe 30,000 uh, euros. 
But of course, this architecture has some problems. Since it, since it was just a simple proof of concept, and there are some problems that can be improved in the future. For example, the main problem is that Blender is directly communicating with the motherboard, so it's not a good in this case, because, for example, if the Blender fails or crashes, we lose all the information in the robot, so we can no longer track it. And also, if we run some heavy computations, like computing proper camera positions directly in Blender, we can also crash it or volatile its own threads, which causes also instant crash. So we need to improve it. Also, the Blender, the, the robot itself was a little bit too small, too weak, because I couldn't handle objects like one meter height or more heavy than, let's say, 10 kilograms. So we need to improve that. So in order to improve that, uh, I had to like found a company called Involved. I did that together with my friend who is an electrical engineer, Piotr Zmuda. And with that team, we could build, build much more advanced hardware because no longer all the task was on me because I'm not, uh, I don't have a degree in electrical engineering. So he could, he, he's specializing in that. So he helped a lot with, with the problem solving here. And this is the new version of the robot. And it looks like this. As you can see, it's much bigger. The, it, it's, of course, a time lapse, so it's not that fast. But in time lapse, in time lapse it looks cooler. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, it scans uh, much bigger objects. Can scan, of course, because this elephant is quite small. And the uh, hardware is much more strong, strong. It's stronger. It can hold like 20 kilograms without a problem. We can utilize many lights. For example, we can implement the photometric stereo for 3D objects, not only 2D objects. But of course, this has some drawbacks, like it's bigger, uh, it's much more complicated to transport it. So of course, there are some costs with in included in that. But improved architecture is a little bit more complicated now. Because I, in this case, I moved whole computations outside of Blender. So in this case, the Blender is just simple UI. And uh, all compu computations are done directly in the backend. So what is the backend? Backend is simply a separate software, like written in Python. But it's running totally not connected with Blender. So if Blender crashes, there's nothing wrong with the backend. It's still running correctly, so we just need to restart Blender, connect again, and it's still perfectly fine. Yeah, we also did some custom protocol, uh, which helped us to, for example, uh, code all the messages to make it safer. For, and also we built, the Piotr Jmuda built the custom PCB, so we're no, no longer using the Arduino, so this PCB is perfectly uh, built for our needs. And let's have a look closer on, those, on this architecture component. So as I said, Blender is mainly a UI right now, so all computations are outside of Blender. We're just using some threads or mod modal operators to track the changes directly in Blender and just sending them through, for example, socket to additional, oops, sorry, something, something went wrong, sorry, yeah. And so if Blender crashes, the backend, of course, still works correctly. And it's possible, it's possible to run currently more advanced computation because we can utilize many threads or even the CUDA, like in GPU processing. So yeah, many, many benefits from that. And we still, of course, can use the all goodness of Blender, like bones and uh, constraints, geometry nodes, and so on. The backend right now computes all robot paths. So it's not right now in the Blender, on the Blender side. Of, uh, as I said, it handles heavy computations, manages communication in much better way. And also we included many security and safety improvements. So for example, you can detect that something is going wrong and communicate to the user or even block the machine. And uh, uh, yeah, supervises all modules. So we can constantly monitor all the stuff and check if everything is going correctly. So in this case, the uh, communication pattern is a bit more complicated as the Blender is not directly communicated with motherboard. So there's a backend between that like a mediator, for example. And, uh, but 
the whole idea behind the backend in this case is quite similar. We just need to have another step, another communication step and module which, which needs to be handled properly. Yeah, custom motherboard. In this case, uh, it was perfectly tailored for our needs. So, for example, we can handle 16 uh, stepper motors at once. All those can be coordinated and smooth movements. Uh, it's basically much better and much uh, like safety proofed compared to Arduino, much more professional and still totally uh, compatible with Blender because it uses the, just the custom like Python library to, custom, to communicate with any anything which uses, for example, USB port. So let's dive what's what, what are the new possibilities in this case? What you can implement in Blender? So, very nice example is the real-time real -time depth preview. The robot uses the Intel Resense depth camera, so we can, in this case, stream the depth from the camera directly to the Blender, and for example, visualize that using the OpenGL or the GPU module in Blender. So it's quite nice to see what the Blender sees right now. And it also, also can be used for the safety purposes, so we can detect like what is the minimum distance to the closest point in the depth map, map and for example, stop the robot or show the like some communication to the to the user. Yeah, so it, it wasn't previously possible to use the Blender res, uh, to use the Intel Resense in Blender because it caused immediate, it crashed immediately the Blender once it starts streaming the data. I have no idea why it happened. I also uh, post the GitHub like ticket about that, but it, it, it couldn't be solved in any way. So in this case, we are moving that computation outside of Blender, so it's works, it, it works again. And also there's no problem with streaming such, such data. It was of course decimated, like downscaled, so we are not streaming whole pixels into the Blender because it will be too slow, like by factor of 10, for example, we can decimate that. And of course, we can stream that using the sockets as previously. The another example here, which is the core of the whole automation in Blender, is the press scan. So using the Intel, Intel Resense, for example, we can capture simplified geometry before we start scanning. So robot knows what is the shape of the object. For example, if you have something like this, it's quite symmetrical. So it's very like cylindrical. It's not a problem to scan with using a simple approach, but if the object is like this and it rotates like this, it's much harder. So in this case, the press scan actually help us to properly distribute the cameras. And uh, yeah, so the press scan is happening. As you can see, the turntable is rotating. I don't have implement, I didn't implement the rotation, like feedback from the motherboard to the blender, so we cannot see in real time what's rotating here. And here using the open 3D library, we can put together all those scans and then import again into blender. So it's, it's very simplified shape, but for, for robot, it's totally good enough to properly distribute the cameras. All right, so if you, also if you want to distribute the cameras on specific shape, like for example, icosphere, because we need to, let's say we want to try some, use some machine learning and we need to use some perfectly distributed cameras. We can also use uh, other geometries like icosphere for that, or even we can distribute cameras for, based on Susan, for example. So there are many possibilities. So all depends what exactly we need. And uh, yeah, view-based positions. So this is quite similar what we are doing while scanning using the using our hands basically. So using the viewport in Blender, we can directly spawn some cameras using the shortcut. So it's very fast to add some custom robot positions. If we are scanning something flat, we can use uh, like a flat plane uh, to distribute that automatically. But if we see that, let's say, alg automatic algorithm fails to cover some angles and we know about that, we can add some custom positions to improve the 
the whole scan later. And the scanning sequence. The scanning sequence was implemented using animation, like uh, keyframes. So once we have the robot positions, the algorithm just iterates through all, the, all those cameras, transforms them into proper space, and put the keyframes for the robot. So before we start the sequence, we can move through whole, like we can just move through the whole the keyframes and check all those positions before any scanning. And also the great feature in this case, it's not very, very visible here, but based on this press scan, the robot uh, keeps the constant distance to the object. So we don't need, and we shouldn't actually use the focus, uh, autofocus, because it changes the camera parameters and it might be much harder to then align properly or create a mesh without the noise for the photogrammetry. So in this case, we can rely totally on manual focus. Once it's properly set, we can like scan for hours uh, with the same parameters. And also the photogrammetry model will be much better in the end. Yeah, so as I said, we can uh, use the keyframes, we can preview all those, and yeah, let's go further. Scan examples. In this case, uh, I, as I said, I, we are using the photometric, photometric stereo in this case. We can capture much more detailed geometries, like we can capture, for example, the PBR materials, all those details which are not possible to be captured using the standard photogrammetry because we need to observe like each pixel in the image, how it behaves under different lighting. And using this, we can then compute all those parameters or for example, displacement map or normal map, specularity, roughness, basically whatever we want. So in this case, we have a photogrammetry model. We've applied a displacement from the photometric stereo and all those uh, PBR parameters. So in this case, like metallic really, really shows that it's, it has some metallicness in, in it. And also the leather looks like a leather and uh, depends on what you want to do with this scan later. Uh, some, for example, some companies wants to use the displacement instead of normal maps. So you can make some changes to like modify this model in ZBrush or sculpt it later. Yeah, the next element, next object was a little bit more, uh, a little bit harder because it has bigger metallic part. But also without that, the, the mesh was quite poor, not very detailed. And uh, using the photometry, we can to take much less positions for the, instead of photogrammetry. Because if you want to, for example, capture very highly detailed objects, we need to capture, let's say, 1,000 camera positions with very macro lens and very high details. And so in this case, I'm just, I just captured some like 200 images, 200 camera positions from larger distance and then improve the final re result using displacement. So it, it wouldn't be possible without the photometry and without the pro proper automation. And uh, summary. So as you can see, the Blender saved us a lot of time, especially at the early stage, because at early stage, it's very easy to fall in some rabbit holes and spend months in there. In this case, by using the software that I already known very well, known very well I could save a lot of time and utilize uh, properly written tools, like for example, inverse kinematics. So I didn't have to study math for weeks to understand it properly. I just can properly program everything to communicate different, uh, different like pieces together. Uh, Blender is also constantly improving without like, we don't need to spend the time on improving the software itself because it's actually handled by other people. So it's also a very nice feature in case of Blender. And uh, I also talked about, told, uh, told, I, I wanted to implement the UI using the OpenGL, but when I started studying it, I thought it, it will take my, me too much time. 
So you actually don't need to know how to build responsive UIs or responsive viewports. You can utilize Blender in this case. And there's, of course, the Blender community, which is awesome. There's a lot of help here and there, and we can find many, many examples in basically whatever we need. And the geometry nodes. I actually didn't tell anything about the geometry nodes at all here because it's still quite new and I'm still not using it in the robot. But for example, I'm sure that it's possible to use geometry nodes to properly distribute cameras, maybe in real time without the processing and utilizing complex algorithms in the backend component. And that's, that's for sure a huge, huge element to improve. And uh, yeah, but one drawback that I can see here, for example, if you want to, let's say, sell your hardware commercially and someone doesn't know the blender. So it might be a problem for someone to actually get used to blender. There's a lot of different buttons, sliders, windows. So it's not definitely not for everyone. And uh, I'm very looking forward to a nice feature in Blender, which is Blender Applications, which, is, which was introduced last year. But I'm, I don't know if it's that still developed, because in this case, we, just, uh, we could like, remove, remove all those not needed stuff in Blender and just keep all that things and features that we actually need. But I'm looking forward to it. Maybe it, it will be happening, maybe not, but yeah. Thank you very much for coming. It's a bit shorter presentation. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, just let me know. We can make some Q&A. Yes? Yes, yeah, so if I generate the G-code for the, for the ARM. Actually, in the, in the first version, which worked using the CNC uh, shield, I used the G-code, that's, that's true. And actually, it's very easy because in G-code, you have a command like G something, X, Y, Z. So you need just properly pick those X, Y, Z values and map to your, let's say, uh, access. Like, for example, change the linear movements to rot rotational movements. So it's totally not a problem. In the robotic, arms, uh, robotic arm, I use the G-code. In the next version, like the proper robotic uh, device, we have a custom like command, custom commands, so we're not relying on G-code. And of course, it has some drawbacks and advantages because uh, using something custom makes it not as popular as G-codes because G-codes are commonly used everywhere. Almost every CNC machine uses that. But in our case, it was simpler to use like custom, custom way of sending commands. But it's, in most cases, it's just the formatting. It, it, it's different format, basically. So we have the information. You can code it whatever you want and however you want. Yes? So in this case, the output from the robot are just images. So you can use whatever you want, like reality capture, MetaShape, or some open source software for that. The only custom uh, software here was the PBR processing tool because there are not very, there's not a lot of like software for that in the market. So we have a custom way to handle that. But still, the, if you have images, you can use whatever you want them. For example, you can use the NERF or the Gaussian splats, Gaussian splatting, which is a very popular method right now. So, yeah, so basically the robot automates the boring thing, which is the taking photos. And is it a commercial project or is it like open source project? Uh, the whole project of the robot? Yeah. Is it open source? Yeah. Are you going to market this or is it more like a case study? Yeah, so. Probably this, I'm sure that right now it will be closed source because are still, we are still investigating the market. If that's gonna fit the market, it, there will be, will be enough needs for that hardware. So right now, for example, we are focusing more, mostly on the services, like providing, 
let's say, for machine learning to, to the museums, to the game dev. And during that time, we are still improving that by using it. So hopefully next year, we'll have something more ready to show more publicly. Yes? How I, how I computed that? Yes, uh, it was very necessary because without those positions, like without the proper algorithm to, pro to compute the optimal camera position and the robot positions, we actually don't have anything more than just automatic robot with moves with camera. So to have more, uh, to have a better quality in the end, we need to make sure that we keep the same distance during the whole capturing process, so we're not too close or too far. We need to compute the coverage, so before we actually put those images into the photogrammetry software, we need to know more or less if the object is properly covered from all sides. And yes, that's a, I think that the automatic uh, camera positions are the core of the whole automation. And uh, without that, there's basically no no automation at all. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, so for the first question about the physical correct camera, we basically we need to figure out what's the lens, what's the lens, like 35 or something like that, what's the sensor size, and we can actually skip the distortion part because it has too small effect in this case to compute the proper camera positions, so we can skip that. Blender camera actually works pretty nice in this case, and in my algorithm, I used uh, OpenGL to compute all those positions. So we can also simulate the OpenGL, the proper camera, physical camera in OpenGL, even with distortion parameters. But uh, of course, we need those distortion parameters somehow computed. So we need to calibrate the camera, then include that into the, the software. And regarding the second question, was. Oh, yeah. I, I'm not using ROS at all, completely. Uh, I wanted to build something from scratch that I know exactly how it works. Probably if I have studied the ROS a little bit more, it might be convenient because I, I see that many like uh, academic uh, people, people from academy or universities uses that a lot. So it's very popular. But in this case, I wanted to go fully custom. And regarding the machine learning for the robotic positions, did you did you mean that? Uh, yeah, actually, whether it's actually doing machine learning to integrate Yeah, so uh, in this case, I'm not using any machine learning because to train some you know networks, we actually need the data. So we need to tell that this. Let's say we have a, this camera position, and we need to tell and train the network, and we need to decide that this camera is correctly positioned, yeah. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely possible, what we are, but we are not there yet. We mostly focus on the hardware and making everything works right now. But yes, we are, we are thinking about that. And actually, this project uh, is used for training some networks in some ways. And we, I definitely want to use that in the future, <laughs> future versions because it's not a problem at all. Yes. Mm 
So the coverage is actually computed after making the press scan. So for example, we can pick like we want to 200 cameras for this specific case on let's say 50 centimeters distance from the surface and we are running the algorithm. It computes most optimal camera positions. And in, after that, we can compute the coverage. So it's, it's based on the, on the press can simplified data. So everything is simplification, of course, because we, need, we have some trade-offs here, here and there. For example, using the simplified press can data, it's much faster. So we don't need to utilize photogrammetry at all in this case, just need to put together some point clouds using transformations. And this, uh, I think that computing the coverage is also the crucial point because if you, let's say, specify too little camera positions, like the maximum number, it won't be possible to properly scan the object. So for example, you will have the, just the half, uh, half scanned object without the full coverage. So it's quite important parameter. And also, Everything depends on the algorithm itself, whether I can implement something better or worse. So it's, uh, there's of course plenty room to, to improve everything with more advanced algorithms. Yes? <laughs> so how, how do I compute the... The camera, all right. So we can use like OpenCV for camera calibration. It's very popular, it works. So in uh, some cases, like for the photometric part, we can use the computed parameters from the photogrammetry because it might be more robust. And then we can, we are, we are using the simple brown Conradi model, which is very, very popular. So it's also supported or can be cr implemented in shaders in OpenGL. So, yeah, but in most cases, I use the simple OpenCV method to calibrate the cameras. Yes, any, any questions? All right, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> this is quite complex stuff because we're using the, let's say, differentiable rendering here to properly map those materials together. And in this case, like metallic is simply a blending, blending factor between the two materials, like dielectric and metals. So in this case, for example, we can rely on the specular value. If the specularity is have, higher than a specific level, we can assume with some, basically we can assume that this surface might be metallic because it reflects light much stronger than simple dia dielectric, which has about 4% um, about of reflection, something like that. But metallics has, um, metallic surfaces have much stronger reflections. So let's say, yeah, I will go a little bit deeper in this topic. So for example, you can capture that using the cross polarization and the parallel polarization. So subtracting that, you can more or less like capture the specularity of the object and the albedo of the object. And using this, you can make even a simple thresholding to capture all those values which are higher than specific threshold. And in most cases, when you don't compare both like rendering with real object, it looks much better than simple photogrammetry. But it's really, really deep topic and there are many methods and very computationally heavy, heavy methods. So it's not a very simple to, to implement that. But it, it, more or less it's possible. All right. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry.
Uh, by actual model, do you mean the photogrammetry final? Your, your physical camera system. Hmm? If you move that physically in real space, will that be represented in the Blender model? Uh, so, yeah, so in, in my case, I firstly need to move the robot in Blender to move it physically, but you mean that can I move it physically to see what's happening in Blender? So it will be possible, but in this case, I will have to use the encoders in each axis. So without that, it's not possible because just uh, simple stepper motors, which have, which doesn't have any logic inside of them. So they cannot communicate you back what's their current position. But using encoders, it's definitely possible to use that. So yeah, we, you will just need uh, some kind of a thread running in Blender, which which is receiving all those details and updates the, the model. Of course, there might be some differences between the reality and the, the blender because the encoders have its uh, specific resolution. So blender is definitely more accurate than physical encoders. But uh, yeah, answering your question, that's, that's possible, but harder. <laughs> yes? Yes, yes, you, you just simply need to rotate the object physically and make sure it, it's not distorted anyway. Like if it's something made from cloth, you have a big problem because you cannot simply rotate it. But yeah, you just simply need to create two separate scans and then combine them in the photogrammetry software. Yes. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the robotic arm is actually paused right now. So right now, it's not developed anymore. I just took it from the, you know, try to use it again. I forgot how to use it, actually. I need to <laughs> learn it again, how, how, it, how to use it. It was very complex, and the UX was very bad at that time. But yeah, it was very great experience building such stuff, but it's not a very good idea in this specific case. It's totally overkill. There are simple uh, mechanic architectures, like, like let's say similar to 3D printers or CNC machines. And uh, yeah, robotic arms are very hard to, to be made properly. And uh, of course the physics is not our friend because yeah. <laughs> All right, it's 50 minutes right now. So thank you again for coming.